This is Coda Radio, episode 261 for June 15th, 2017. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Scale Your Code. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris, and perched on his porch, yelling at the young whippersnappers in his yard. Why, yes, it's our host, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hello, Mike. Misa not Michael, boy. Oh, no. We took steps! Michael's a gun because Rikai's a dick. <laughs> oh no! It's shots What's fired. What's with the no edit to call me? Shots fired right at the top of the show. He's a jackass. Shots fired, shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. Soundboard's gone crazy. Oh no! And there goes the theme. Whoop, 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 uh, whoop, whoop, Rikai, whoop. you know I love you. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah, well, uh, you know, see, once we hit record, we generally just keep it in the show. That's a little dirty secret about the show. I know you're new, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I know you didn't oh, know this. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm only like, <laughs> doing this for four years. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about the feedback from last week, Chris. Yeah, well, you knew even that. My tr- even you knew. my trusty email filter, Darth Maul. You know, frankly, he was cut. Kind of- the people that made it through that part of it, though, said it was a really good episode because last week we did something that we haven't really done in the past before with our WWDC coverage. We did two things that I think made a total True. huge difference. First of all, we didn't do it live and we waited yes. till so the live event was on Monday. We waited till Thursday and and used that time to read up on everything. So instead of doing like sort of like a armchair skepticism, like how a Linux user's first take on it or something like that, you know, from a point of like a little bit of skepticism. I was able to read all the docs, figure out what stuff was really cool, kind of get an idea of how it works, how it's going to improve people's workflow, and go at it from that angle. And you had a bunch of stuff that you looked into, and you brought, the th- honestly, some great perspectives to it that I think led to some really good conversation about the whole thing. And I think it was our best WWDC episode ever. Uh, if, it, you know. it was. I mean, we're still like two for four on me freaking out live on the air. Yeah. But... <laughs> That is true. <laughs> that's maybe that's just uh, that also. There's becomes... something about WWDC that just like brings all the bile to the surface. It really gets you fired up. Yeah, it does. Well, and the Comey testimony was literally right before we got on the air. Remember, it just yeah, finished. Yeah. It wrapped. Up. I, I, I swear to God, I wasn't like C-spanning that the entire time. Oh no, of course not. Neither was I. Of course, yeah. of course. You know what? Now it's happening. See, this sets a different tone for the show. As we're going on the air right now, Amazon. This isn't really a point, a topic of the show, but I just thought I'd mention this since we're breaking news. Amazon is just unveiled the twenty dollar dash wand. That is, it's like a and that they're attempting to buy Slack for nine billion dollars. Also that, yes. Also that. Yeah. Uh, it's it's essentially a barcode reader with Alexa built in. Uh, Cancel. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I'm usually pretty good about that. What was that built in there, Chris? What was that? I'm usually pretty good about that. But it can scan a barcode of any item and then add it to your shopping cart. And it's going to be water resistant and magnetic so you can stick it to the fridge. Okay. So all this is pretty cool. $20. $20. I sort of feel like they should just give it to you because they're going to make a shit ton of money off of that. I feel like there already are. There's no way this thing, this thing's got... It's worth 20 bucks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the, the microphone assembly and the Alexa, cancel, the Echo, cancel. The, the, yes! The, I know, sorry. It's because... Hey, I'm, Google, what's it called? Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's because, the reason why I'm doing it is because I'm reading their marketing. I'm looking at their, uh, at, their, at, their, at their picture of it right now, and it's got the word all over it, so I keep saying it. But the, the, the technology to make an Echo communicate with the Echo cloud services, even if it's just a Wi-Fi chip, a, 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 a ARM chip, and a, and a, a mic array, it's got to be about 20 bucks worth of stuff. You think? Yeah, I'm close to it. And then you combine a, a nice housing, uh, the magnet that's got to be good enough, and a barcode scanner. Um, yeah, man, I think it's I, – I wouldn't be surprised if they're taking a bit of a loss on it. Okay, sure. Anyways, that's not really what we're here today. We're here to talk about other things today. Uh, we have many things to get into. Um, and, uh, oh, you put this in. This, You know, it's funny. So we have, like, this weird, like, dock conflict this week, which we don't really normally have. And uh, so I saw this story but didn't realize it was in our lineup. So it's like it's like a, I'm getting surprised by our story. Uh, developers who use spaces make more money than those peebs who use tabs in their code. 
So they, this is a Stack Overflow survey. They surveyed 28,000 respondents, and uh, they uh, also got 12,000 of them to, to also provide their salary, which is kind of interesting. And uh, it breaks down like this. 40.7% use tabs, and 41.8% use spaces, with 175 using both. No, that's interesting, you say. No, it's not. Not really. Um, <clears throat> how the hell does this work out, though? using both? That was the only part. Oh, keep going. Probably whatever the project uses, that's got to be the response. I'll just use whatever well, project. Sh- yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, but here's, I don't know how this works out, but the median developer who uses spaces has a salary of $59,000, and the median tab developer has a salary of $43,000 in U.S. currency. Right. So remember, this is worldwide, and they're just converting everything to USD. And the developers just, who responded both were just generally, in the sense, the indistinguishable tabs. from the tabs. So I use spaces. Um, and it's because I'm a better person. Wow. Okay. See, I expected you to just tear this thing apart and say there's no way this is legit. This is a- No, this is all bullshit, right? Do you know why I use spaces? Because it's the goddamn default in all the IntelliJ tools. Oh. Right, yeah. and, and so is Visual Studio Code. Oh, and if you switch between dis- different systems, so there is a legitimate reason not to use tabs, right? Um, but also, apparently, spaces can take more space. I don't know in terms of memory. I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard. This is like the more. I mean, but we're talking bits now. I love so it, though. I love it. Yeah, let's not get too. I don't even want to get into this. Yeah, well, first of all, point. we got to debate if we should be defragging our hard drives, and then and then after we've talked about that, let's talk about our uh, run times. Wait, what? I just defragged my soul last night. Oh, I'd like to hear about that. <laughs> there was a young priest, an old priest, and a sexy rabbi, and a lot of booze, I imagine. Yeah, well, that happens twice a week now. <laughs> um, who, who gives a crap, right? Proper etiquette, just so you know, if you do a GitHub pull request. You use whatever the maintainer of the project says you use. Yeah. So even if you think spaces are the be-all and end-all, use freaking tabs if they're using tabs. Now, I happen to think spaces are better, but this is not something... Last time I thought about this was that episode of Silicon Valley where uh, the HBO show, if you've never heard of it, where Richard Hendricks, the main character, dumps that girl because she's using tabs. Yeah, that was great. Right? Like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It really is. It is. It is one of those uh, causation does not mean correlation, etc. Type things. It's uh, although <laughs> it is going to. It will now be another quiver in the arrow. What is it? What do you, when you have an arrow in your quiver? You know what is that called? Like when you got like a go to now. So when the tabs versus space debate comes up in like some chat room, you can now toss this link in their face. <laughs> you should only hire people who do tabs because you save about twelve thousand dollars. Oh, but um, bump. Hey. <laughs> Now, uh, Business? guess, yeah, yeah, exactly. Hold on. Business? There it is. So Marshmallow and Lollipop, doing pretty good, uh, but Nougat, no mm. one's really using it. Actually, the beard no. just got his update today. I wonder how that, I think it's- So this entire time, I thought the beard was your girlfriend. Uh, are you, are you, why would I call my girlfriend beard? I sort sense. of thought you were gay. <laughs> You should watch my vlog. You should probably watch my vlog. Awkward. Uh, <laughs> moving right along. So, yeah, nougat. No one's taking a bite of that tasty nougat. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad, actually. Um, I, I guess I guess I'm kind of dis- – I guess I'm just sort of a little exhausted by this conversation because it feels like it's almost irrelevant at this point. It got it got to 8.9% and then 7.1%. The latest version is at 0.6% adoption. I feel like we talk about this every 90 days, and for the last two years, my answer has been the same. Google APIs, right? Just use the goddamn Google support libraries and you will be okay. Yeah, I think people care. I think it, it must come up because it's um it's there's some security ramifications. Well, sure, for from the user's perspective, but who cares about them? Well, oh. obviously not Google or the carriers or the OEMs. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, obviously. <sighs> you know, did you see so did we talk about the essential phone on here? We did. We did briefly, right? I said it, I, I. I thought I did. Who knows what I said last week? Yeah. Um, no, we did. We did. Did you see that he did get a? He got an essential phone. I think it's. Is it Sprint? Yeah, but it's Sprint, dude. And I have T-Mobile, and I was like, yes, I will get an essential phone. And then it was Sprint, and I was like, no, I need cell service. Yeah. So I think it's pretty easy to say this is going nowhere. Yeah. Sprint. Sorry, but 
at least in my area, it doesn't work. In fact, down where I'm moving to, T-Mobile doesn't work, so I'm going to have to go to freaking Verizon, which is terrible. Well, the thing is, is it's not even like I'm not even slamming Sprint. It's just uh, if you want to come in and you want to compete with uh, iPhone and Pixel, you've got to have the market density, and you're just not going to achieve that on on right. Sprint. It's it's not even a comment on the on the network. It's a comment on the market dynamics of the situation. Well, you know, if you want a top tier Android phone, and you know folks who've been listening for a while, I am not a Samsung fan at all, right? Uh, the S8 is actually a really nice phone. I've played with it. I've read some reviews. Buddy of mine has it. It's it's a great device if you want to be in the Android space and you want to spend like $500. Uh, and it's not of, it's not running Nougat yet either, is it? I think it's about no, to be or something? Of, of course not. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it's running the one before it, Marshmallow. Mm-hmm. That is, isn't that a remarkable thing? I mean, this has been the never-ending story, right, Chris, with, with Android. It just, you know, they just can't manage to strong but arm even, the carriers. Of the, but yeah. they shipped, the S8 shipped, what, six months after Nougat came out? Isn't that remarkable to you? I don't know if it was full six months, but it was something like four or five. I guess since you're the development cycle of the S8, it you know probably wasn't even finalized. Well, but but. Nougat was in was available for developers sometime before that. Mm -hmm. Presumably, if I was an OEM, I would also look at that, right? Yeah. I don't want to talk too much about mobile because I know we have some really good stuff to get into. But I wanted to toss just an idea out there: is uh, having reflected on WWDC stuff now for a couple of weeks, really, uh, it's been a couple of weeks. Do you feel like iOS just sort of lapped um, Android in a lot of really important ways? So the two that are really, really standing out to me is the way they've implemented, actually three, the way they've implemented spaces on the iPad, the way they've implemented drag and drop in mm-hmm. iOS, um, and I would say probably it's probably the third, the third tier, the third leg of that is they've also released really great hardware to go along with it. And that just seems like it's a it's a combination, especially in the tablet side, that Android just got lapped on. Like taking the phones out of it for a second and just looking at the tablets, I think they just really got stomped. Well, so I, I have a couple points here, actually. Uh, the first being, I think a, the only thing you didn't mention, ARKit, is actually a huge deal. Um, it's not a huge deal for me. It's not yeah, going to be just, a huge deal, I think, I'm for most of I'm just talking like, in like where Android now needs to catch up. I guess ARKit is probably another one. Although they, Google's been... Well, they have the Google Dream. Well, yeah. I forgot the name of the. It's Dream, Dream something. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's only available. See, see, there's a rub there. That's only available on certain devices at certain levels. And this goes back to the operating system thing, right? The and, well, and also the power, right? So Google has has a couple tiers problem, and I don't want to get into the fragmentation conversation too much. But outside of the U.S., the U.K., and like you know Europe, right? There are Android devices that are the majority, or this according to numbers I've seen, let's just say a significant plurality that just aren't very powerful. Which means they can't do Google Dream in particular. That's a problem. Um, one other weird thing I've seen happen in the last, I would say, three months. You know, Chris, I redid Buccaneer.io, and I'm, I'm not really marketing towards mobile at all. I, I have one or two blog posts here and there talking about it, but really I'm marketing towards you know DevOps and Docker. Do you know what I've been getting in people kind of like asking about? Mm-mm. Swift development. The train has almost stopped where people went from hybrid to wanting to know about iOS or at the very least iOS with an Android component hmm. later. Hmm. I don't know if that's excitement because it is the time of year, right? WWDC, new hardware, blah, blah, blah. Or somehow has the Android, um, you know, it's companies, right? Are they now just willing to pony up for the iOS devices and not buy those cheap Android tablets that, let's say, last year they were buying, you know, 100, you know, Asus, whatevers? Well, how much is the, the cheapest tablet from Apple? Isn't they've, they've lowered because the, they have like lower end. It's like 250 now. It's really I, not that bad. I could go take a look. But uh, I, I guess I, you know, Adam from Vancouver very rightly asked, like, who cares about tablets? And, um, I guess it's been sort of crossing my mind recently that I'm not crazy happy with any desktop anymore. Like uh, my favorite desktop that I've loved for years, GNOME 3, has begun becoming unreliable for me on multiple systems. And I, I, I'm sure eventually get worked out. Um, but so what do I do? So I switch to a desktop now that I don't quite enjoy using as much. And I wonder if maybe... 
it wouldn't be worth me considering switching to something like a Chromebook or an iPad Pro, which is probably what I go for, um, and use that to do my email, my my Telegram, my my show prep, my Slack, my 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 video chats, like my gaming, um, and I do all of that on there. And then I have a MacBook that I use for when I need to use Final Cut or Motion, and not really worry about what my desktop environment is anymore, and just sort of take a break from all of it. So that's why when I that's why when I was thinking about like how this some of the changes they've made to iOS 11 for the iPad probably might make it more possible for me to really do that. A file system on iOS is going to be a big game changer for me. Having having a file manager is going to be a big game changer. Yeah, I mean, I already do all of my like, or, or not all, but much of my accounting, you know, business development management stuff on on my iPad Pro. In fact, I'm looking at that 10.5 inch one with Lust. I think that's just a sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, right, you pay taxes, you have some sort of accounting needs, some sort of business needs. Um, why couldn't you just do what I do and, and do all that stuff on a tablet? That's kind of what I'm wondering, yeah. I mean, I, I don't love the idea of a Chromebook because remember a couple of years ago, I did try for some of my uh, sales reps a Chromebook deployment and we ended up having to change to uh, MacBook uh, Airs at the time. So I don't. perhaps they're better now, but... The other, th- I think the other thing that sort of tilts me towards the iPad is the uh, they've really they are crushing it. I mean, just you can blast your you can sear your retinas with the brightness of that screen. That's true, and um, that is a killer feature when you're droning in in the summer because I I can't see my screen very well in the bright sun, and the iPhone is better than most. Uh, and it's already difficult. And so this, so the other thing that would, a, a large, high resolution, extremely bright portable screen that I could use for drone photography uh, would also, it's almost worth it just for that. Um, and so, cause it's even brighter now than the, DJI makes a controller for like a lot of money that is super bright that you can get to control your drone for this exact problem. And it's a little Android tablet. And now the iPad has a, is a much better screen and much brighter than that thing is. So I kind of, I kind of like, I kind of like the versatility. And the other thing is, is um, my kids all have iPads, so there's a lot of iOS games that we all share, and we have a family account set up, so they can all share the purchases and whatnot. So I could just, I, jo- I could join that with my iPad, and I get all the stuff they already bought, <laughs> or I bought for them. Yeah, I mean, can can we just go ahead and announce it? What? What's that? The Apple Action Show. <laughs> yeah, right. The Every I- Sunday at about nine. Welcome uh, to iPad West. today. Oh wait, somebody already tried that. <laughs> oh, oof, oof, no, oof, you know, I, actually, I think there's not really there's not really a, a a a story to be had there. It's just another work tool. I don't think it's like yeah. it, back in the day. What that would there could be a content to be had there, and now it's like okay, well, I'm going to use this tool for a little while to do some work. Yeah, I mean, I want to say just to stop the hate mail. I'm doing this show on the retail again. Yeah, but yeah. It's it's different tools that goes back to that. So yeah. the, all of the machines in this room, I'm sitting in front of one, two, three, four, five. They're uh, they're all running Linux, and yeah. so it's those are the right. I would never like I would never use an iPad for that. I would never use an iPad to edit video. But if I'm browsing you, the web, reading email, and uh, uh, taking drone photography and doing Slack, well, actually, it seems like a tablet would do a pretty good job at that. Now, if you were to use Yahoo Mail, what device would that be on? Oh, that would absolutely be on my Marissa Mayer. Uh, oh. uh, my, my, it's got little, it's got little rhinestones on it. Uh, yeah, that's wow. interesting. This is All interesting. Right, Chris at JupiterBroadcasting dot com. That's that's him. What? No, she does. She has a phone. Okay, well, I'm not. I, I have rhinestones on her phone. She did. She did. Uh, so Marissa Mayer she... is out now. Yeah, the acquisition's complete, and uh, she says in her exit interview, she's looking forward to using Gmail again. <laughs> you know what? I get that. I, I, I'm going to clap. I applaud her honesty. Is that like a <laughs> is that like a super deep burn? I I feel like not updating Yahoo Mail for a number of years is also a deep burn. She was everyone quote, who's forced to use it. She was quoted as saying, "I look forward to using Gmail again. I'm always faster when using the tool I designed myself." <laughs> Translation. <laughs> hey hey, uh, Sundar, uh, can I come home, please? She uh, she then later tweeted. Uh, this was an out-of-text comment about Gmail's design and how it's evolved. I will continue to also use the excellent Yahoo Mail. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Just moving along from this. Um, I love it, dude. I love it. So other things that suck. $9 billion from Slack. Okay. <sighs> yeah. I don't really yeah. have much to say beyond, beyond that, really. 
You know, I, I just think that's that, a number that doesn't mean anything. It's not going to happen. Microsoft's also sniffing around. It's not going to happen. Slack's not going anywhere. I call it right now. Amazon's not. Well, maybe. If any, if they're going to sell to anybody, it'd be Amazon, and that'd be such a good purchase. Um, let's talk about. It. Let's okay. Let's so let's shift gears. Uh, let's let's take a minute. We'll talk about scale your code. And then we're going to do a deep dive into our topics this week. So go to scaleyourcode.com and get access to interviews, inside looks, and tutorials. You subscribe, and you'll get an email when new stuff gets posted, and you get access to the interviews with experts. You can listen to top-notch professionals who talk about all of the type of issues they've run into from technical challenges to cultural challenges, team and scaling challenges. Hear people directly hear directly from the people that solve these kinds of problems. I mean, that's, that's really the value in it. If you, want to build, if you want to build really impressive, reliable software, you can learn how to develop the best code and the best infrastructure from the people who have done it. I've covered some of the interviews on here, and I thought I'd mention one that we haven't talked about before because it's one of these things that can make such a huge difference with your site. How to optimize images for faster load times. And so this is with Kelly Sutton, and Kelly's the chief product officer at Imagix. He's also worked on Layer Vault, Designer News, Hack College, and The Cult of Less. And they talk about optimizing images, how it can give you some really big savings and results and way, way improve loading time. So check it out. Go to scaleyourcode.com. Sign up to the mailing list, get access to the interviews. It's low flow, so don't worry about getting spam and a bunch of stuff like that. Scaleyourcode.com. And thanks to Scale Your Code for sponsoring the Coda Radio program. Booda boop, booda boop, booda boop. <clears throat> so, um... Let's, do you want to warm up by talking about this uh, this scam that's been going on in the App Store, or do you want to jump into BotKit? It's your choice. I say, sir, it is dealer's choice today. I, I, let's just do it quick. Okay, so there is a scam on the App Store. Uh, someone posted this to Subratic. It's a post from 9to5Max, a pretty reputable source. It is an app that claims that it's a free trial and then tr- attempts to charge your... Um, app store credit card or if you have an Apple Pay account whatever you basically whatever you pay for your apps on the app store with like 100 or 400 bucks yeah 99.99 for a 7 day subscription is one option right and it will keep trying to do it so like one guy got ripped off for like $400 just be mindful right Apple does vet the apps and certainly if your corners are not correctly rounded they will reject you or if you're 32 bit some some people are still bitter um but somehow this got through so just be mindful when you're downloading stuff. There's a couple yeah. of these in the app. This, when I say a couple, supposedly there's a lot of these in the app. This store. is insidious too because it's uh, it's targeting people who uh, who know that they should be concerned about security but don't know how to protect themselves. So they look for things like a VPN app. So one of them was like a faux VPN app. The other one is a, a virus scanner for iOS, which if you have any knowledge of how iOS security architecture works, you know that's going to do literally nothing for you. <laughs> nothing. And with a $99.99 seven-day trial subscription. Uh, right. Then some other people are trying to like, you know cover their tracks, and they're getting these fake VPNs with $100 subscription buttons. Uh, there was a Sensor Tower one. Uh, or uh, there was an app that, according to Sensor Tower, who did the uh, the uh, the investigation, sorry, shouldn't mix that up, um, said that there was one that charged around eighty thousand per month or received eighty thousand per month in revenue, uh, and it offered essentially no services, and it just basically makes money by scamming people into agreeing for a subscription service. And, you know, you make the payment system super easy; it's one thumbprint away. You have it on your Touch ID sensor. Next thing you know, <laughs> you got a phony antivirus subscription. And so, this is how you make money on the App Store now. Yeah, in fact, I think part of the dirty play here is they took advantage of the App Store search ads to get visibility. That's how people yeah, found that's, them. Is, that's exactly what they did. So that means this thing made it through app review and it made it through the advertising. Also means Apple got a significant cut of this money because they got the search ads and then they got the 30%. But we, hey, whatever. And that didn't show up on their radar either. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, that's that. So okay, yeah, we could talk about – Let's talk about bots, Chris. Yeah, I want to. I want to talk about bots. I'm, I'm, it's a topic that I feel like isn't really moving as fast as I envisioned it, but boy, am I excited about it. So uh, Marky Mark, the great Mark Zuck, hit the Facebook Messenger bot is now going to help you negotiate purchases with people. Yeah, it's gonna, so it's, it's, what the hell is this? So they're, so they're using a bot to do negotiations between humans? <laughs> So it, it, it is, it, it's a pretty good read. Uh, we have the article in the show notes. Basically, it assigns a mathematical value to each option based on the response it gets and tries to optimize for the best possible outcome for you. Just like you might do if you had read The Art of the Deal, perhaps. Just to name one book you may have read, theoretically. Um, it tries to... And they have a 
so this they have that Facebook Marketplace product, right, where you can sell like secondhand stuff on Facebook. You could see where this might kind of make sense, uh, almost like an automated bidding system on eBay, where you have like the bot automatically negotiates for you based on parameters that you set. It's where I think they're going with this, hmm. but from a from a proof of concept. Um, it, under the hood, it's basically a decision tree. I mean, there's a nice diagram to show you how and how it works. Yeah, they said they but smashed is, game theory together with deep learning. Yep, with derp learning. Yep. Um, and it, it works a lot like any classic decision tree you learned about in school with whatever juicy trove of data Facebook has about how people do things on their marketplace product and on other... So it's not super clear where they're getting this data from. No, that's for sure. My, my assumption is based on the nature of what the bot is doing and knowing that my wife loves the Facebook marketplace to like sell things. Um, that seems like the obvious place, right? Because it opens a chat bubble. You offer a product. Someone says, I'm interested. Then you negotiate the price. I can't say that it's not necessarily getting from data from other places. You know, I Could actually, I, I don't blame them. I mean, if they have the data, it's theirs. We're giving it. No, to I'm them. not saying it's malicious. I'm just saying that you know, I want to make sure that if because I know a couple of folks on Facebook, listen, I'm not trying to misrepresent the technology, but based on the limited information they provided in their press release, it seems like the way it works, um, based on the diagrams, based on the chart. And again, I would encourage you if you're interested, go ahead and read their documentation on this. It's actually really cool. Hmm. But it it takes their treasure trove of data and says, This is how quote unquote successful people operate um, in this context. And these are, it assigns mathematical values to each decision and bot kind of negotiates, not necessarily for the best individual to move, um, but for the best overall outcome. Another bot that does this, if we want to use the term loosely, is AlphaGo. Um, In fact, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I just shared a a white paper on AlphaGo where it just beat the the reigning Chinese champion, uh, I forgot her name, but she's a prodigy in in the Go. uh, Go, if you don't know, is an ancient board game much more complicated than chess and the way uh, the comment she had after the game was that AlphaGo's moves seem strange to her and the reason for that was it wasn't calculating the best move right now for the situation it was calculating the best overall move for the game where a human player would be much more you know you said this I'm responding this way, right? You moved your piece here. I mean, I've, I don't play Go, but I play chess. So, you know, those of you who play chess, there's such a thing as a, you know, you could do a gambit, you can do a sacrifice. You know, humans are are pretty pretty close to, or pretty prone to overprotecting their pieces, right? So a human might be less likely to do a non-clear sacrifice, where an AI, because it can do so many more calculations a second, um, and this is literally what AlphaGo does, uh, we'll look at the long game and say, well, this move might seem insane now, but given if all these variables come into place, I have this scenario, which is worth X, and then this that's worth Y, and it goes through and it just basically hardcore calculates it out. I feel like I got in the weeds here, Chris. No, I find it fascinating. And so then they, and then so that's how they make the decision process. And then the way they do the dialogue, it sounds like by my read of it, is they essentially treated it like they would game dialogue, where the AI comes up with the dialogue for the player yeah. and then the player responds and then they so it's so it uses that so it uses the process you described to come up with con- conclusions and then it uses the quote unquote game theory uh, game dialogue mechanic to actually do the back and forth in the chat. That's fascinating. It's a good mashup. Yeah, and Facebook's kind of edge here, and we'll, we'll move on to, because I actually have some code I'm going to share with the folks. Um, but face, Facebook's edge here is, that is a hard company name to pronounce, is that they have you know all of your data, all of your dick pics, everything. Right. And they so, have, and they also know the names of your friends and things, so they can, it can, it can spell oh, things properly. That, uh, let, you know let, what I mean? Like it can get... Some- it can get contact names correct. It can it can get your it can use the correct spelling and and, and things like that. And, and it knows where you work. It knows your job title. Yeah. So it probably knows on average what what that job title pays in your zip code. Mm. So when it's negotiating with you, it knows you know maybe five hundred dollars is trivial to a so software engineer. You're going engineer. deep now. You're going deep. You think that's- right? I, well, this is how I would use the data. Right? It's five hundred bucks to a San Francisco Valley engineer is not a lot of money. Five hundred bucks to uh, a podcaster you know, the, the, in Washington. 
right? Or the barista at Starbucks is a lot of money, right? Yeah. So you you might be more aggressive on the the fellow who has the job. You can see the bot now. I found this dick pic. Would you like to go for a lower price? <laughs> you know. Oh, and here's your mother's email address. Little, little automatic <laughs> bot blackmail. What could go wrong? <laughs> I'm sure that's extortion, but we we could just keep going. Yeah, well, you know, bots don't have ethics. So what do you? So anyway, do? this this is an area I'm I'm definitely fascinated in. Um, if anybody wants to hit me up on Telegram and nerd about nerd out about this, happy to do it. But uh, yeah, the extortion bot is coming. Yeah, we also have a, a Jupiter Broadcasting Telegram group. You can find it at bit.ly slash JB Telegram if you want to get in on that chaos. And you can probably rouse Michael in there if uh, you want to get made. But careful, don't do it at the wrong time because you, you don't know what version you're going to get. You never know. Oh, well, I am a Gemini and uh, I am writing a Comey bot. He's going to help me. Oh, man. Speaking of writing uh, some bots, you do have a little uh, sample here, a little, a little, little sample I- sample. I do. So I started writing this, and to be fair, this is not the complete thing, Um, but I started writing this. Her name is Gretel. I love her very much. About mm, nine months to a year ago, this is the main file. It is coming off a bot kit, which is an open source bot framework that ties into the Microsoft bot framework. Uh, Slack, oh Jesus, a bunch of crap. Uh, You can go on GitHub and look at bot kit if you want. (laughs) But if you go ahead and scroll down there, you can see, we can just kind of quickly go through the uh, anatomy of this file. It is This is the basic file, right? Because I was lazy. I just did it all in one big old JavaScript file. It is running under the hood, Node.js. There's a bunch of comments in there that I left in because it generates it for you. Um, basically, what it is is it listens on a server running Node.js and Express. And it listens, in this case, it ties into a Slack channel and listens for certain things. So one of the things I had uh, her, right, I called it Reddle doing, was nag my team about, you know, every time somebody says good morning for the first time of the day, say, hey, did you update your Jira tickets to your time? In oh, August? my God. Oh, God, that's awful. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some other basic stuff. I mean, I have another version of it that I can actually look at Jira and see, like, if somebody hasn't moved a ticket. I like it when you write a bot. It's a jerk. It's a jerk bot. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's... I, I was envisioning, uh, do you remember the old movie, uh, My Girl Friday? Old, I don't think uh, so. Little... No, you old oh, man. My God. Hey, don't sass me, child. <laughs> so you're killing me here, man. <laughs> Basically, you can see there's a lot of fun stuff. This is pure JavaScript because I wasn't yet cool in using TypeScript when I wrote this. Um, I decided not to try to commercialize this because I'm just not focused on bots right now. So if anybody wants to do something with it, have at thee. It is a pretty, uh, pretty, basic implementation if you understand uh basic functional programming basic node and basic javascript i think you'll be okay sounds basic yeah it's pretty basic i would say (laughs) but not written in basic which maybe would have been more appropriate oh one of the interesting factors about this though is how heavily it uses uh es6 and functional concepts and this is this is like you could probably get something like this done. Um, oh, fair warning! I wrote this like three versions ago in Botkit, so there are simpler ways and, and less verbose ways to do things than I did them. But you could theoretically get something like this done in probably a couple hours now in the current version, which I think is really cool. Uh, I'm running this, of course, on a Do server because it is just a Node Express app. I'm pushing it up with Doku. If you want to learn more about Docker and Doku, go to Buccaneer.io. I had to get it in there. And yeah, that's it. I mean, does it look crazy to you, Chris? Um, you know, it actually looks pretty follow. I can follow it. It's pretty followable, I should say. All my code is readable, Chris. Let's, that's let's nice. Talk. That's that's nice code. It's nice. I gotta say, we haven't done like just here's some code for a while on the show. Yeah. I, I will say the gist editor somehow mangled some of the parentheses, so I apologize for that. You'll have to fix mm, that, mm, but. Mm. Yeah. All right. We'll have a link to it in the show notes if you guys want to check out the gist. Hmm. I'm excited about all of this stuff. These the the small little ways in which we have used uh, automation, either by taking advantage of people's other people's bots or the ones we've written, I have changed my tone on something that I thought was a. Uh, this is just another hype, and now it's like, oh, okay, we can the couple of things, even just stupid things like taking data from one place and putting it in a Slack channel for me to review. So I just have one dashboard to go to to review a bunch of stuff is mm-hmm. useful. And it sounds small, but it's useful, and it keeps me on top of stuff more than in a way 
I was before. I discovered that we had a a live show on Saturday last week <laughs> on my own podcasting network. I didn't even know about, but thanks to uh, a Slack bot and the beard, uh, I was I was able to you know like what, what's going on here and get things figured out. And we had everything all lined up and got it done. But it was you know bots that keeping track of when things change and then notifying us that made it happen, made it made it all kind of smooth. And instead of something that would have caught us completely by surprise, we we were we were prepared for a day in advance. So, I say, good work, sir. Good, good work. Thank you, sir. You know a place to host these bots? DigitalOcean. Our next Boom. sponsor here. DigitalOcean. Yeah, go over there and use our promo code Coder Digital after you create an account. You apply it, and you get a $10 credit. You can spin up a DigitalOcean rig in seconds. You can start at $5 a month or pay hours. I love the uh, – they have all kinds of price ranges. I think the $0.03 cents an hour is just a phenomenal rig for what you pay. If you want to try out, say, um, Cockpit. I was talking about that recently on Linux Unplugged. It's a great way to manage a Linux server for people that aren't necessarily experts. Experts. You know, you may say you want to put up a simple server, you want to run three or four or five containers on it, and you're not a longtime Linux admin. Cockpit is a really easy way to manage your Linux box. But you probably want to at least check it out. And DigitalOcean is the way I did that. I spun up a rig in seconds. It's all SSD, so whatever storage size you want. They have block storage you can attach more as you need it. It's all based on SSD, so their performance is just great. They have data centers all over the world. They have super fast connections into the hypervisors, and they're always rolling out new features like monitoring and alerting so you can see how your application's performing on DigitalOcean and get a sense of when something's gone down. And this is a brilliant system they've rolled out, these cloud firewalls where you have just a central location in the DigitalOcean dashboard to define rules. And then they block the traffic at the network level so it never hits your system, never takes away resources from your droplet. And then they, they sort of like put a cherry on top of all of it with really, really good documentation and a simple, straightforward, full-featured API. It's, <laughs> it's how it should be done. From the, from the documentation to the API, the dashboard, and the infrastructure in the service, it is, it is look, at the, look at this document. This is really good stuff. DigitalOcean.com, just use our promo code CODERDIGITAL. That'll give you a $10 credit, and it supports the show. DigitalOcean.com, thanks to DigitalOcean, and thanks for using our promo code CODERDIGITAL. Mr. Dominic, Mr. Dominic, I was browsing Buccaneer.io. Uh, ahoy, matey. I was over there browsing the really stunning Buccaneer.io. Holy crap, if that's not a pretty site. Really. Branded all up in here, uh, containers and just all. Look at that. If you're watching the video version, look at that thing. That's Mike's site. Look at that. That is. Well, I, mo I modeled it after you. A kind of flamboyant, colorful pirate is what I was going for. You nailed it. You nailed it. You nailed it. So this is an interesting post because it's sort of like if I'm grokking where you're coming from, there's there's some so much so much new stuff coming down the horizon that you're going to have to start managing your projects in a totally different way. Am I following? Yes. This is actually a common problem uh, and great clickbait. So iOS apps aren't little anymore. Yeah. Right. They're not you know, do it in 80 hours, pump it out, and you're good to go. They're actually really large pieces of software, especially if you're going to start using any of these multitasking or um, AR kit-like features in iOS 11. Core ML need, and all that stuff. Is core, gonna well, Core ML, you're in, yeah, you're in a whole other ballgame. Uh, people need to start, people being your managers, people listening to the show, need to think about, you know, you're not just like having a WordPress site built here, right? This is a full enterprise application, a full piece of technology that needs some some maintenance. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been brought in, look at an iOS project, and you can tell it was just like shopped out to some vendor, you know, as a quick slap together as fast as we can with whatever our components are. And there was no thought to like long-term maintainability or practices or handing it off to the internal team. Uh, so I'm kind of trying to bring the DevOps mentality you get working with Docker and Doku and you know continuous integration, for instance, like Bitbucket pipelines, tools like that from the server side and bring that to iOS and to Android. But this post particularly talks about iOS 11. Hmm. Um, and there's a little promo, Chris. If you go ahead and take a look at that link there at the bottom, there's a form where you can fill out for just a free console on to see where you are and where you could go. What is the least costly, uh, least painful way to get started? Usually the answer to that question is set up some sort of automated build, automated test running. Um, but there's, you know, whether you're running Xamarin, Swift, um, you know, React or Ionic, it is totally doable. 
there's so many tools. Let me just give you a quick example. There's uh, there's Hockey App, Selenium, Jenkins. If mm. you want to be a little more old school, there's mm-hmm. tons of ways we could do this. Yeah, it's true. If you if you really want to be sexy and use Docker, we could even hook it up to Bitbucket pipelines. Um, really worth looking into because these mobile applications are not small one-offs anymore. Uh, they are long-term commitments now. Yeah, not only is the app itself usually a huge project now by 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 standards, even just from a couple of years ago, but there's typically a a large server side component that goes with it in, in a lot of cases. And it might just be a database, it could be an HTTP server, but it could be something more sophisticated too. And you got to manage that as well. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I'm finding is a lot of organizations are starting to understand that they need to manage their backends a little better or more of these DevOps practices. But they see their mobile apps as some totally different like self-contained thing. Yeah. Well, the, um, that's, that's how you sort of treated it early on. It, that's that was sort Well, that's of, how it was treated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And now it's yeah, the whole world has shifted. Now it's for the whole world has changed. A lot of places that I which was shocking to me to watch it happen in front of me was a lot of places that started developing on mobile apps that became their number one platform. Yeah, and then the website became secondary, which was a huge shift for them. And I watched it happen internally at a couple of different companies. And it was is the damnedest thing because it was like you realize there's sometimes market forces happening that you're not even you, as a geek like you see all these things going on. You're like, okay, there's another device, there's another device, there's another way to use this. And then all of a sudden you start seeing consumer adoption happen around you. And like, oh shit, this is this is a shift. And for both these companies, they went from Internet Explorer only applications, yeah. and one I worked at for like more than a year during this transition to uh, mobile apps uh, for iPad specifically and Android tablets. Hell of a hell yeah, of a transition. Hell and, of a change. I and mean, that, we're, we're and seeing, now it's even yeah. bigger, right? I would say, well, it's even bigger because the apps are more complex. Mm-hmm, and exactly. I, you know, I have to hand it to Apple uh, in particular. They're in, doing a good job of making hybrid kind of hard. <laughs> so <laughs> like <laughs> if you really like for instance if you really want AR kit, you're not going to be able to share that code with Android, right? If you want core ML, you're not sharing that code with Android, even if you're doing it in Xamarin. Yeah, I did um, I did I did sit I was sitting during the keynote going, God, please say you're going to support Vulkan. Please say you're going to support Vulkan. No, 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 no that w- that's something we didn't even mention. I found that amazing. <laughs> no Vulkan support whatsoever. No, just and and then I thought cuz then I thought well if they don't support Vulkan, they're never going to get VR. But so but instead, instead somehow themselves. they got Valve and they got Unreal to support Metal. I didn't see that coming. Well, I mean Metal is actually a huge platform, right? I mean, I yeah, think Unity yeah. also supports Metal, if I'm yep, not... Yep, Unity is the other one. Yep, yeah, that's huge. That's basically the major checkboxes, right? Right, Valve, Unity, you're done. <sighs> Man, and Unreal. I just Game thought, over. I didn't, I thought Apple, I thought Apple would have to bend to them, not that they would bend to Apple. I thought it was going to go well, the other way. I thought Vulcan would, would be the It would have winner. been really nice. I mean, I, I don't want to get into like a holy war about Metal versus Vulcan because, you know, it's not really my area, but standards are great. <laughs> Right, if we can have standards industry wide that work, right, we're gonna have DirectX OpenGL all over it again. Only, right, well, only now it, we have DirectX it's too. Metal, it's Metal Vulcan. Yeah, but DirectX. So I thought Microsoft was gonna go Vulcan too. Come on, dude. They're, they're gonna. Drink I just it. sworn I read that somewhere. Maybe, but um, I would imagine it's gonna be a transition. That's for sure. DirectX. Well, DirectX is, it powers the Xbox too. Exactly. So have to. Exactly. Although no, no, uh, no AR, no VR on the Xbox S, which I know again is a little off topic. Yeah, no but. Hololens. Which yeah. come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Visual Studio for Mac isn't bad. So and VS Code is my daily driver now. A little uh, pro tip for Coda Radio: if all things go as planned, Coda Radio listeners, heads up, Mister Dominic will be joining us on uh, User Air fourteen, I believe. So that should be fun. A little, uh, a little cross show promo there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, also, um, while we're promoing, I should say we have a, uh, I know this, again, isn't really probably going to p- apply to many people in the audience, but we do have a barbecue on the 4th of July here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Studio. If you're somewhere in the Pacific Northwest area, or will be, and have the day off and would like me to feed you, go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting to find out more. We're celebrating 200 episodes of uh, Linux Unplugged by throwing a barbecue. Wow. So we want to start planning soon. So people are going to go meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. All, all the show's audiences are welcome. It's not just for Linux Unplugged. But now it's Linux, It's called Linux Unplugged because you unplugged your Linux machines and went to Macs, right? Wow. 
dude, you, you take you, at the end of the show, you attack me. You go. I just didn't you just hear me say I think I'm going to switch to iPads? Didn't you just? Uh, I'm that's, that's why I did that. I'll do the multi pad lifestyle where I'll have like I'll have an iPad for Slack and I'll have an iPad for Telegram. No, I'm totally kidding. I'm not doing Jesus that. Jesus Christ! So that be like the Batman? Uh, what is it? The thing he shows Fox at the end of the Dark Knight? It's just <laughs> a wall of iPads. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it worked for uh, Star Trek. You know, Captain Picard often had multiple tab pa- tablets or pads all over his table. You know, he, he you know like, what? And he could say things like, hey, Google. God damn it. I need to figure out what's wrong with it. Oh, it's not working? I, you know, I did something wrong here. Like I maybe forgot to pay Comcast. I think um, it's going to, uh, except for we're talking right now. So that's probably not. Uh, yeah. I, think, I, think the, uh, I think the problem is it knows you're going you're gonna to leave it for a HomePod. It knows you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna skip out on it eventually. Uh, it, it, it is not an appropriate topic for the show, but as a guy who listens to vinyl records, that seems very unlikely. <laughs> oh, you don't like all that processing, huh? <clears throat> well, it, vinyl no, records, how, my how God, exactly my God. That? We should pick up on vinyl records at some point. You know what we what? need to do? We need to do a Coda Radio holiday special where uh, we could dig into uh, indie games and vinyl records, and then we'll just put it out one day when we can't make it for a week. That that sounds great. You know what? In fact, I... Uh, I think that's great. My hipster cred will be up. In fact, we and might want to talk about it soon since you're going to be moving in a little bit. So we might want to yeah, talk about it. Yeah, uh, and I'm going to be homeless for a little bit because there's a problem with the house I'm moving into. <laughs> well, at least that's not stressful. So that's good. So that's yeah, no, it's super okay. good. I mean, that's super good. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should do a little pre record. So maybe we can talk about that in the future too. Well, we, can, yeah, we don't have to worry about that too soon. I'm yeah. going to be leaving, I'm going to be leaving uh, in a month from now. Uh, actually, uh, one day less than a month from now, I'm going to go to Montana. Ooh, you're so be a cowboy. Uh, we'll have to figure that out too. But we'll either have well, we, you know, what people would love is if that if that son of a bitch West came back in here, that that uh, that slick podcaster who honestly, who honestly should just do the show all the time. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is he's too busy with a day job, so you're stuck with me. But I think yeah, people I would love it if he could make you. it in here while I was gone because he can come in right studio, you know. Uh, we have the studio microphone and the mo- and the board and all that. So maybe that's Listen, what I- Wes is big busy using spaces and making twelve grand more than us. <laughs> oh, there you go. That, that's that's what he's doing. Brings it all together. It brings it all together. All right, everybody. Well, we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. We'd love to get your feedback at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. You can choose Coda Radio there. And we're now on Thursdays. We've moved. Find our time at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar where the robots will convert it to your local time. You can get more Coda Radio at our subreddit, codaradio.reddit.com, where you can leave feedback. And uh, if there was something you wanted to hear us talk about, or something you'd rather us talk about, submit it to the subreddit. And it could be considered codaradio.reddit.com. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Coda Radio program. And we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>